नमस्कार नमस्कार आई एम गोइंग टू क्विकली स्टार्ट द मीटिंग बिकॉज आफ्टर दैट आई स्विच माय डिवाइस बट वेलकम टू कशर के टाइप इट्स सिक्स अक्टूबर ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी थ्री एंड वी आर गोइंग टू डिस्कस ऑफ कश्मीर सरगा फोर्टीन कुरुक्षेत्र विद राकेश जी एंड सुभाष जी से दस ऑल्स वेल सो या प्लीज टेक इट अवे एंड आई जस्ट जॉइन बैक इन इन अमेंट All right so Kurukshetra is a very 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 mighty Action-packed. mighty <laughs> chapter very mighty chapter and um so let me just uh, uh, uh make one introductory comment it's designed to be a provocative comment uh and then uh, we'll just hand it over to you guys and do the discussion that way uh all of you are very interested in kashmir shaivism i see that and uh, i see you have started vigyan bharat tantra and so uh some of you will at least remember that in the kashmir shaivite uh, cosmological framework uh, you know there are 36 tatwas uh, and uh, there's a hierarchy in the creative descent of consciousness and at the sixth state is the one where you have maya and maya is where the existential mantle uh uh is uh, manifested and it's manifested through uh, uh the panchakas the five has the limitations which essentially end up limiting the infinite to the finite and so there are five panchakas we won't go into that uh, but the fifth one is very interesting now uh, you know kshetra kshetra obviously refers to classically a field a space uh, and uh, a guru of course is associated with the uh, 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 guru people but uh, the fifth kanchuka uh, is uh, you know there is kala there is vidya there is raga there is kal the fifth one niyati is very interesting because it associates space and cause together and one of the great profound uh, questions that has come out is uh, at least uh, for people in the world of kashmir shaivism is uh, uh why is cause causality uh associated with space uh and not associated with time uh you know it could be jointly space and time uh, or it could be with time but why is it associated with space and not at all with time so there are several hypotheses Uh, uh one hypothesis is is uh time is too unstable right you have one extreme momentariness the buddhist philosophy uh, so it's too unstable uh, how can you have causality when there's momentariness so that's one extreme there's another school of thought which is look uh, time has only one causality which is time kills everything <laughs> So there is no other <laughs> cause that can survive. So and then there are theories in between. Um, I think Subhash Kagji has written on this. Uh, there's a paper that he has written that you should go and read about the kanchukas and the limitations. But coming to our particular story, the basic thing is this: uh, whatever exists in form and space has causality, has functionality. is always active and so you see in this chapter kurukshetra chapter that all guns are firing 
everything is firing. Everything is firing. Rasa is firing, physical weapons are firing, mental weapons are firing. <laughs> there isn't anything that is not firing. And so if you experience what one calls the fog of war, then you know what? You have the right experience. Then you are right in the middle of this war because this is a war where everything is firing. So with that as sort of a starting point, my first question to you is, and we'll go around, uh, we'll, I'll ask a couple of questions. But my first question to you is, how did Dawn come across to you as a warrior in this chapter? Because she is the Arjuna of this chapter. And how did she come across to you? I think she like, seemed to be pretty calm and in control. Mm -hmm. for, for me, it was, um, I I would have never imagined for her to be dancing that gracefully. Mm -hmm. uh, I know she always wanted to be the Rasika. Uh, mm -hmm. And when I, I, it was difficult to imagine for me because you always have this, uh, Xena warrior prince. I mean, I have the Xena warrior princess kind of an image, but this was someone who mm -hmm. was trying to bring out the rasas in uh, the five billion men. Mm -hmm. And the way that it's described, it's so graceful, and every movement is deliberate. It, it means you know taking her right, left, right leg over the left foot. So everything is so deliberate and thought of. Mm -hmm. um, that's something that um, uh, struck me struck me the most. Like very graceful in the way that she wanted and the Rasika image that she wanted uh, about herself. Mm. Yeah, and for me, in addition to what has already been said, I think the in spite of being such a good student, I mean, obviously she seemed to remember everything that she was supposed to do. Mm -hmm. There was doubt in her mind, like mm -hmm. meaning she like there was this point when she said oh this is my time my time has come they're going to you know those they're going to do the surgery on her and set decapitate her essentially mm -hmm. but then it worked it suddenly worked whatever she had been doing suddenly worked so for me that almost seemed like she believed it after it happened i mean or maybe i should say that she didn't she wasn't arrogant in her mm. learnings and she was uh she was very self-assured but still she had that i'm not sure what the right word is but mm -hmm. until it happened she had that that uh, almost doubt but she didn't give up so but, but it didn't mm -hmm. succeed so that's just something that i'm not sure what you call it but since we're talking mm -hmm. about a warrior i think a warrior should not mm -hmm. be overly confident mm -hmm. yeah um so uh but she was very sharp very alert and and you know very um i think her execution was impeccable obviously mm -hmm. uh, so that that's what I'm, i have to say i'll stop mm -hmm. okay I thought, anybody else sorry did i got somebody else no, i was just saying that's a good that's a good point i was thinking of that as well sorry mm -hmm. I thought of her as a great general who had full mm -hmm. confidence in all her five people, uh, mm -hmm. started showing leadership qualities, used mm -hmm. beauty and brains both to execute what she had planned to do. And uh, in a, for a bit, she did act a bit, hu she still had that human left, like her mom, you know, for a minute she did think of her mom when mm -hmm. they were all getting ready for this. And that mm -hmm. was, that was touching but mm -hmm. but yes i think over the chapters now finally there is a woman who is very self-assured and she's all mm -hmm. dressed up uh, she's using everything in her power to go out and fight this evil knowing that mm -hmm. there is every chance that they might lose but still going mm -hmm. out with grace grace under fire mm -hmm. basically that was what i thought yeah mm -hmm. i think that uh, that what we learned about going into the battlefield being the most beautiful self you yes, can sir. that yeah. mm -hmm. 
happen uh, you know through dawn mm -hmm. uh, i i particularly enjoyed finally getting to read more about the kuri lullaby which i was curious about in <laughs> chapter 1 so it finally made its uh, appearance and it was such a beautiful uh, usage of of mm -hmm. that type of rasa and, and like you know the way she evokes that humanity in her father for yeah. mm -hmm. or you know uh, you know the master stroke at the end so mm -hmm. i think that was a beautiful touch and uh, really br brings out the uh, again like the clarity and clarity in her mind about what she is doing and why and and how she has to go about it so mm -hmm. um, can see all these details in her execution. It's just very, very uh, marvelous to read. Mm. Yeah, <clears throat> like everyone else, I also agree that you know she showed in this uh, total self confidence. You know, she knew what her plan was, how to execute it, and she was just mm. she, she. It looked like she didn't have any doubts that it's going to work. To me, at least, all her doubts were earlier in the book. But once uh, she actually went to the battle, she seemed totally poised and all that. Uh, mm -hmm. And yeah, I was impressed by the way she handled everything. Good. So now that was a trick question. It was supposed to set you up. <laughs> and the reason it was a trick question was how did she end up here? Remember where we started? We started with her as an innocent girl, 16 years old. It's her birthday. And yet you just described her in these very glowing terms. How did she end up there? What what was it that brought her from where she was to now a full-fledged Niti warrior? And the answer is stories. Stories. These were stories that she was exposed to that unlocked the various powers in her. And so you have now seen the power of stories yourself. It was very natural. It was a you know very natural journey. She would go to different people. They would tell her stories, and she was absorbing each one. And then when the time came, she she used it. She used it. But let's now. Uh, come to the second thing about Kurukshetra, which is now very relevant. This is clearly a battle between, you know, life intelligence versus universal intelligence or artificial intelligence. And so obviously, you know, in the story, there's a bias that life intelligence will never be matched, never be matched. Uh, but uh, what is your uh, reaction to that? What was your reaction to that? Did you, did you feel that it felt right that life intelligence did find a way and did triumph? Or do you feel afraid that one day artificial intelligence will destroy humanity and uh, what was when you re read through this whole chapter what was your reaction to the two forces i thought there was what? potential for collaboration hmm? Potential. What was that? Potential for collaboration. Between who? Sorry? The the life and artificial that was, intelligence. That was, life a, joke. Intelligence that was a joke. That was a joke. That was a joke. But it, it could it could be. I, I I won't completely disagree with you. 
Go ahead. For Go me, ahead, initially, it looked like AI was always oh, winning, but a lag. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead, Arti. Finish it. Uh, yeah, Arti. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. Okay. So, initially, it looked like AI was um, winning and mm -hmm. uh, till the last moment, till um, the till you realize that the 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 there's this thing about mine, 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 right? Mama, mama which mm. AI had constantly fed and everything was about the self and I. And suddenly mm. that I shifted to uh, the emotion of dawn that got evoked in each of the men. Mm -hmm. So my, my dawn. So mm. like what they had, what you could see is a selfish I, then because of dawn's dance and, you know, that evocative um, mm -hmm. uh, dance that she did and it, there was still some something that um, made people, you know, uh, those men think of their own daughters and those all different mm -hmm. ones. Uh, and then it became my dawn, and that was like the turning point where mm -hmm. um, the gears shifted in favor of life intelligence. So, mm -hmm. uh, so I think even though it seemed like we were losing, eventually there was something that sparked uh, the life intelligence out and. Uh, that that changed the outcome of the the war as well. Mm. So life intelligence in the end. So uh, I know Subhashji wants to go next. So why don't we let him go next? No, I just wanted to make a small point. You know, yeah. a lot of the uh, stories uh, from India are ultimately a um, kind of a. A retelling of the mythic uh, fight between the Asuras and the Devas. And Asuras are the body, Devas are the senses connected most closely to the Atma, right? Because the Atma is the light, which is what gives the capacity to the senses to uh, make sense of what the world is. But so it's the body power, which you could call the AI power versus the transcending power of the light of the Atma, Shiva. Shiva is like Prakash, right? So um, I, I think what happens in all these battles, when you read the Puranas or and all other texts, is that the Asuras become more and more powerful. And then their own uh, contradictions uh, lead to their collapse. You know, for example, if you look at the US now, uh, with its emphasis only on the body, now there is so much of confusion about gender, about this, about that. They're fighting, the culture is fighting itself. And this is like the mythic uh, uh, Asur Dev Sangram that we have, or Samudra Mantan. So I, so I think ultimately in all these fights, uh, the life force uh, wins eventually almost in a miraculous way, in a kind of a chamatkar, you know? The body force is so powerful. Wherever you see, you see that they are triumphing. And at the last minute, and of course, in the original Samudra Mantan, it's the it's when the Asuras have, have the Amrit in the Amrit Kalash in their hands. And what Vishnu does is he creates Mohini. Uh, and they look at the beauty of Mohini, they are totally they forget why they are there until that Kalash is snatch from their hands. So it, that's a kind of a miraculous thing. So ultimately, you do need a kind of a mi uh, miracle, something which is not expected at all for this to uh, reach its uh, true conclusion. Yeah. Well said, Subhashi. So look, I, I just came back from China, and uh, it was sort of uh, mind-blowing uh, mind-blowing because I made some incredible discoveries which uh, uh, actually have a lot of implication on Kashmir's impact on China. But what you find is that uh, Asuric cultures, which uh, Subhashi focused on the body, 
whether it is communism, whether it is uh, some of the other frameworks, uh, they have no rasa. They have no rasa. So uh, one can uh, talk about atma and consciousness, but for many people that may become abstract. But rasa is something that is the juice of life, the juice of life. And rasa is something that one can experience. And you find that all these cultures are terrified of rasa. So as Subhashji said, even in the Samundra Mantan story, uh, Mohani appears. And these people, they look at Mohani just like uh, 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 all these five billion men looked at Dawn. And they experience a certain rasa. And so uh, these killjoy Asuric cultures, uh, they are terrified of rasa. So they won't allow dance. They won't allow music. It's it's very very controlled. Absolutely, they, uh, yeah. Go ahead, yeah no, be, go beautiful, ahead, uh, absolutely beautiful. Uh, I totally agree with you. And uh, the most powerful rasa, you know, shingar rasa, beauty right. related to beauty. beauty, and beauty, beauty is overpowering, which is why in certain cultures they don't want be beautiful things to be shown because they are afraid uh, that will uh, somehow subvert them. And um, and in many ways uh, that's happening um, even um, in uh, in contemporary America or contemporary yeah. West right now. But um, th there's um, there's one small point I wanted to make uh, uh, related to beauty. And uh, yeah. I uh, a couple of years ago I wrote a little haiku on it, which would mm -hmm. um, interest you. Maybe you've come across it already because I wrote it up somewhere in some essay. It's floating around. And uh, this haiku is just three lines. The first line is, autumn moon alone, the heaving pond. That's it. Autumn moon is this beauty out in the sky uh, alone. You can't reach it. The heaving pond is the individual, is water, the pond in the water on Earth. It can never reach the moon. But it still is attracted, you know. So this is the situation of each individual. You know, it's very subtle. It's very subtle, and it's all captured in all the um, in all the descriptions, even in Nati Shastra about uh, um, about the Ashtanaikas and so on, because they are communicating different emotions. So this is ultimately this tremendous overpowering power that uh, the, uh, the, the body culture cannot deal with. And ultimately, that becomes the undoing. In fact, you know what's so interesting is that all the Puranas, which are so completely misunderstood by Western scholars because they're only looking at it from the surface structure, ultimately are talking of these very, very subtle things, very subtle ideas related to psychological states, related to how we we are also bodies and when we talk of we are bodies that's our mind see so there's a struggle going on with, between each one of us the mind and the moon the moon is that light that we try to aspire to and the mind is our conscious mind which is totally in the body you know so this all these struggles are all over you know outside in our imagination in abstraction, and then within ourselves, and within ourselves. And it's only when we go through this struggle that we can move forward. Sorry for this lecture. My wife always tells no, me. No, 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 no. It's, it's uh, <laughs> right, right on the money. So, so the key lesson here is that ultimately the Niti warrior's strength lies in the Niti warrior being a Rasika. And it is so important. If there's one thing this book should tell you, 
it should tell you why Professor Sidney Sheldon, who is at Columbia University, a slightly controversial uh, for some people, but nonetheless, he says that India's, which in this case is Kashmir, Rasa theory is its greatest contribution to humanity. So out of all of the things that he has looked at, he has said Rasa theory, because it is not to be found anywhere else in the world. The best the West can come up with is aesthetics. Uh, beauty is defined in terms of symmetry, proportion, but nowhere is there the profound framework of Rasa. So if there's one thing I would say to you, it is study Kashmir Shaivism by all means, study Vagyan Bharatantra by all means, and study all those. But you know what? in terms of daily life, understand rasa, become a rasaka, celebrate dance. I often say this, if your priest doesn't dance, run away from that priest. Run away from that priest. So rasa is the fastest way to experience consciousness. Most of us, don't want to become like Ramna Maharishi, who was permanently in a state of consciousness. If you want to be permanently in a state of consciousness, fine, go to the Himalayas. But for householders, which is what we all are, our ancestors devised this technology where we could very quickly experience and get a taste a taste of the highest state and the power that comes from it. So that is the key lesson of this uh, uh, chapter. Uh, Niti warrior is everything, but at the end of the day, the ultimate weapon the Niti warrior has is their rasika. They know how to use that that weapon, and as uh, Subhashi said, the problem with the Asuric world today is whatever choices you have are ugly. Right? Ugly. Biden is seen as ugly. Trump is seen as ugly. That always happens in the Asuric world. They are ugly. Okay, let me turn this over to you now. Go ahead, each one of you, and ask questions and comments. Uh, we will just make the floor open to you guys. I just had a few key points which Subhashi helped me make those to you, but now we can start. Shruti, why don't you start first? Anything else you want to comment on in this chapter? Any questions you have? Um, I will say I love the use of uh, different kind of poetry and shlokas and kind of things throughout the throughout the chapter it was very enriching uh, to see all the interplay there um, the the theory around the parasympathetic and central nervous system the uh, the, the the build up to the the different reverse sort of data deluge was was very enjoyable to read um, uh, just stop, just stop yeah. right there. Yeah. The central nervous system is a system of control. Mm. The para system, PNS, at the end of the day, it is swatantra. Mm. It is involuntary. You don't control it. Mm. It is swatantra. And that's why it becomes a savior. Mm. It becomes a savior because you can't control it. Nobody can control it. It is swatantra. It's involuntary. It mm. springs into action. It is the action of life. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, continue. Mm. Thank you. 
I think questions wise, there were a couple of very like minor, I would say, points that, that I had a question on. One was, I'm trying to find it in the page, but mm -hmm. there was like a description of, I think, Dushita or Arman, Arman probably, mm -hmm. what he's wearing. Mm -hmm. And then there <coughs> were all these letters, like, ah, that's a, letters. the gene, yeah. that's the gene, gene sequence. Oh, okay, okay. okay. Oh. It's the gene sequence letters. <laughs> okay. I, yeah, I yeah, thought, yeah. like, I, I have to, like, put those letters in some sequence to make sense and make a word yeah. out of it, but even that didn't happen. <laughs> those are g gene sequence letters. Yeah, that's okay, where it is. Uh -huh. Thank you for that. Um, <laughs> and then, yeah, I really enjoyed the, I mean, as horrifying as the stone throwing uh, uh, fight was, I think I really enjoyed the, the back and forth with all the Kashmiri, uh, like, insults. Yeah. Insults. yeah, I learned a couple of them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so that uh, story is actually based on truth. Those two villages have historically been at war with each other. And in Kashmir's history, they would indulge in massive stone throwing battles. My goodness. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So okay. there is truth even there. These are two actual villages in Srinagar. Yeah, neighbor, neighborhoods. Yeah. Okay. Are you referring to Satu when you say Satu? Yeah. Yeah, My yeah, goodness. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. Vajji will understand why I asked that question. Yeah, we are from we are from Satu, Satu? right? Oh, yeah. Ahalmar and Satu, those are the two neighborhoods that were always in stone throwing battles with each other in ancient times. So Satu always. is the Satu Barbarsha. And yes. the and the verses that are quoted are exactly the verses that they would say to each other in Kashmiri, which I have translated. <laughs> but so this uh, is... but Rakesh, uh, do you know uh, that if you took a boat to cross yeah. um, Jhelum, you know, near the Band and so on, as yeah. you would cross over, sometimes yeah. you see these women hurl the most horrific um, uh, curses, not curses, um, uh, what, what are these bad words at each other for hours for days? So and then when they had to take a rest, they would put that uh, that basket down. So that means it's rest until <laughs> it would resume. Truce, truce, okay. not not truce. Yeah. This is yeah. uh, break, break for break time out. Yeah, yeah, and you can't even imagine the kind of abuses. I don't know if you have any of her, any of you have heard them. I have heard them. I can tell you. The most astonishing, uh, which anybody would would be so ashamed even to repeat to anyone that that was part of, and these yeah, are the yeah. women, yeah, who would do that. Yes. So I wanted to reflect that. Hans, Hans, the, these are the Hans boys, right? Yeah, yeah, they, yeah. They, yeah. They, that, they, yeah. They, they used to be awful. So mm -hmm. I wanted to reflect a little bit in there, and I think Shruti liked that. Like and you <laughs> and you hung it on us poor Satu Barbar Shah. Yeah, I'm a little bit in shock. Uh, these these two neighborhoods, I don't know. It's sort of like historically, they would go at each other. So you know, it was astonishing and entertaining. I would say. Yeah, yeah but very yeah. painful to hear about the stone throwing. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so who's next? Who, who wants to go next? I'll go. Okay. Yeah. Um, besides what Shrutiji has already covered, um, there was this, um, the thing that struck me uh, most was uh, the chanting of mine, mine, uh, that's done across the stadium, right? Which is so much in contrast to um, what we know from Shaivism, right? Like I am Shiva and being detached with the self or uh, what you think with, Nirvana Shatakam, detaching mm -hmm. yourself and everything around AI and Arman was about mine, Mamaha, mm -hmm. Mamaha. So a huge contrast there. That's what struck me. Um, you, There's a mention of uh, when these two uh, were 
around the stone fight as well that usually there's a representative from palestine in the finals but mm-hmm. this year both are from kashmir i i didn't get that like why why was it a miss or why would it be someone from palestine i just put that in okay okay <laughs> just put that in okay. yeah so look uh, the demon war cry the demon war cry when they go into battle is mama 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 mine mine that's what they are fighting <laughs> for and uh, conversely the devas is nama nama not mine not mm-hmm. mine. Oh, okay. so <laughs> so it is it is uh, uh, it is the battle cry of the demons, mine, mine, mine. And at the end of the day, when you look at AI, ultimately it is nothing but a surveillance technology. I mean, China was such a frightening experience. I, I have gone to China now for the last 30 years, starting in 1990, you will be astonished that you won't see a single policeman in China on the street. They are all behind screens. Every square inch has a camera. When you walk into the gate in an airport, you know, in America or India, anywhere else, they'll take your boarding card, they'll swipe it, and then they'll say, uh, have a good flight, Mr. Paul, and you enter the plane. In China, no such thing. You walk up, there is a camera. The camera recognizes you, and right on the screen it says 14A, and the gates open and you walk through the gates and then they close for the next person. It's facial recognition. They don't even look at your ticket. Ticket can be faked. Your face can't be faked. So this technology, it's all about your mind. I own you. I own you. But go ahead, continue. Um, and then uh, the point that I like <clears throat> was when Dawn realizes uh, that she's different when she walks in mm. um, and in seven seconds the jarring noise slowed, stumbled and then died down and there's yeah. this moment where she recognizes and says I was different. Like you you feel, you feel that um, she's come a long way like you said from yeah. when it started on her birthday and what she has come for now. Yeah. Um, I, I like the reference on um, the Leela that you said uh, when Shiva comes, Shiv comes to meet baby Krishna. That's a Kashmiri uh, Leela, right? Yeah. I love that. And I yeah, love yeah, the yeah, reference yeah. for it's, it. It's very sweet, Leela. It's very sweet. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's yeah, like, yeah. it's a story, like it's something which is made into a story, right? Like the conversation yeah. that happens between Yashoda and this is so yeah. beautiful. I, I like that. Uh, I liked how um, uh, throughout that time, even though this, um, she keeps on recalling the lessons that she has learned along the way as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, what Meghavahana did, uh, sorry, uh, Mool, they were taught to think beyond the limits. And then Patanjali yeah. talking about the stillness and that's when things mm-hmm. will come to you, you will mirror the self. Um, even with these high intense situations where it's a matter of life or death and conquer um or die for life she she keep she has that um uh, stability in her mind and equanimity to, to keep reminding herself of the lessons and not just purely be driven by instincts which is a huge contrast to how the 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 heat movement was growing and you're keeping a tra- we're keeping a track of how the temperature is rising and going and everything so reactive with uh ai man but with her it felt like very conscious and and deliberate um I like that but i i had a question <clears throat> also to something that you said earlier about experiencing all the rasas mm. because there's there's all these rasas and emotions uh which are beautiful of course but then there's also the side that you have to find your your 
peace or the calmness and that's when um life i mean that that's when you will mirror the self and that's when you become one with god so <clears throat> you've got these rasas that you want to experience and then you also want to can you be still it's the stillness of mind that patanjali refers to with trying to experience all these rasas as well how does that happen it's either yeah. or <laughs> yeah so uh the whole purpose of rasa is to actually free up the mind your mind is right now trapped it's trapped remember that famous scene when you are dancers mm. and then they talk and he says what were you thinking about when you were dancing and she says oh, I, nothing i wasn't thinking about anything that's what rasa does when you experience rasa your mind basically is It's not nothing. in control you've gone beyond the mind you've gone beyond the mind and so that's why i say don't tell people have a good day tell people have a wondrous day and you should try to each day create a wondrous experience for yourself it can be as simple each day telling yourself i am going to take time out and smell the fragrance of a flower or i'm going to savor a piece of chocolate or i'm going to close my eyes and listen to sitar music or santur music in the way that vigyan bhairav tantra has trained me which is not to listen to the high notes but to focus on the dying of cognition what happens between the notes and when you begin to do that you will begin to bring rasa in your life and when you bring rasa in your life you will find your mind will become detached <laughs> it will become settled and this lesson has not changed when kota rani in chapter 1 is being interviewed in her graduation exam she's asked a question what is a woman's greatest weapon and she answers that a woman never loses her presence of mind never so become rasakas i that's what i'm trying to tell you is the secret of kashmir create wonder create that experience of rasa and if you start consciously going towards that direction then you will see not only will you find that now your mind is freer but you will each one of you will become more creative pandit gopi krishna used to say i cannot promise you that you will all end up with kundalini enlightenment but i can promise you you will become more more creative so uh, more creative yeah. go ahead subhash yeah uh, absolutely you know you got to forget your own mind that's why music is great if you hear wonderful music you lose the sense of yourself right you yeah. get absorbed in it yeah. likewise great dance likewise a great movie uh, art that's why arts uh, absolutely rakesh is absolutely right and america or the west also had its great tradition of the fine arts but right now everything has been cheapened you know you have the social media the internet and internet has some good stuff 
but it also has some very, very bad stuff, especially for children who don't know how to deal with that. And likewise, you know, elsewhere. So I think this is a, this is, but, but certainly I totally agree with Rakesh. Uh, the power of Rasa is that you uh, forget who you were. And in fact, number five or number six of the Shiva Sutra, Shakti Chakra Sandhane Vishwa Samharaha, which means that when you are one with the chakra, Shakti Chakra within you, then the Vishwa goes away, destroys. And that's what you want. You want the Vishwa into which you are entangled, right? Which is our entanglement of our mind. We, uh, because even if we are trying to, be very abstract, etc. We're still entangled. So, but once you are in that chakra, chakra is you know a high point of experience. Could be a rasa experience, not necessarily the six chakras of the body. Uh, great music or dance or whatever else, and that is the point of transformation. I can, I can tell you personally, the very first time I saw. A classical dance was uh, there used to be an Odissi dancer. Uh, what was her name? Sanjukta Panigrahi. It was absolutely electrifying. Some of the electrifying experiences of my childhood is once when I saw her, Sanjukta Panigrahi. The second was when I read Kathopanishad, you know, the story of Nachiketa and his conversation with death. Absolutely electrifying. I could, you know, that is a rasa that takes you away from your normal. Um, you know, state of being. Yeah. And that's when you get yeah. transformed. And that is what Punar Janma is all about. Rebirth is when you die, you cease to be who you were because of a peak experience, and then you are reborn. You know, now we have made it, okay, reborn, death, etc. Actually, rebirth takes place many times in one's own body. That is the esoteric meaning of it. Thank you. And uh, la last one on why why the first day of uh, the ninth month? Yeah, so autumn moon, that's when Kashmir's birthday uh, Actually, is. Really? It really is. That's when Kashmir was born, according to Nilmat Purana. That is the birthday of Kashmir. But uh, you will be shocked when I say to you that uh, this uh, autumn moon is also the biggest celebration in China. Full moon. Uh, the mid autumn festival. Mid autumn festival, full moon ah, yeah. is the biggest festival in China. We happened to be there when it was there. And the Communist Party Last can't week. control it. I can show you photographs of all these Chinese people who had come out. They were pointing excitedly at the sky. At the moon. Uh, and, uh, you know, it is. Uh, and I think I've already told you once before that uh, unlike the West, when they think of enlightenment, they give you a golden halo and all that stuff. I've already told you, not so in India, not so in Kashmir. In Kashmir, we associate enlightenment with moonlight. Sharda is in the moon beams. And she is most powerful in autumn on full moon. So that is the night when dawn has maximum power because of that autumn Sharda light. Awesome. Thanks. So, amazing stuff. You know, I, I feel I, I have so many thoughts. I should start meditating, but I have, I, I'll try to organize my thoughts. Uh, firstly, I want to say, we should be really grateful that th the teacher to uh, student ratio in this group is uh, kind of amazing. <laughs> um, I don't think I, I I don't think I can stress enough how much how fortunate we are. Really, thanks thanks to both of you. And um, 
Another thing I wanted to just say that sh you mentioned Odissi and Shruti actually learns Odissi dancing. So that is something that I wanted to mention. Uh, and yeah, um, and about like the world, world, uh, you know, disappears when you become a Rasika, right? And or like when you are uh, entrenched in that. And I, I feel like personally when I am singing and making music uh, is something that First of all, I don't know where the time goes and it will be like four or five hours and I wouldn't notice. And also the sense of space goes away. Like basically you feel like you're in a black hole uh, type of a feeling. Like you feel like there's nothing. So um, it's a great feeling to have. And um, uh, and I'm, I'm like on a journey of like this to just satiate my curiosity. Uh, to see when people say, oh, if you're enlightened, you'll be in that state forever. So that would be awesome, right? Uh, but at the same time, I'm very afraid after like reading and, um, you know, listening to people talking about Kundalini rising and stuff. Anyways, forget about that thought now. But I have a question, <laughs> a question on the book, uh, on the chapter. Uh, when, uh, so this is like a basic question. So. Uh, uh, and because I got a bit confused with peripheral nervous system, you mentioned that it is obviously instinctive. It's not in your control. Uh, it's something that is more like uh, to save your, um, I would say, uh, like uh, save your instinct or something like that. So how would an AI be programmed to do that? One. And two, um, if that if you are if the ai people are capable of experiencing rasa then they could also be conscious right they could also be capable of being conscious so two points one and the book refers to it ai systems inherently are master slave systems inherently. You cannot in AI create something that is autonomous to the master. That's, that's the first assertion that is made in the story. Now, second, this idea that can AI entities experience rasa. Mm -hmm. Now, I have given a little bit of insight into the technology of how rasa is biologically and chemically created within you. And what is its, you know, uh, what is its inherent technology? That is not something that uh, entities that don't have life energy can duplicate. It is it is rasa is inherent inherent to life and living forms, so that cannot be duplicated. Rasa belongs However, to life. Okay, I understand that, but how did then the how did then they individually experience their own dawn? Smiling at me. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What? The, I'm embarrassed to answer that question. If you have a room, uh, uh, let's say you have a theater uh, with uh, 500 men and a gorgeous, beautiful woman walks on the stage, what do you think is going on inside the head of each man? Hey, no, they're, that's each, fine. they're each fantasizing. And the no, reverse that... is the reverse is that... true. I, in Krishna okay. and Radha, each Radha thinks she is dancing with her own Krishna. Okay, they can do whatever they want. But my yeah. question is, they are still yeah. finding <laughs> they're still finding their rasas or whatever that yeah. con, con, yeah. misconstrued like whatever that yeah. is. Yeah. So they are so but at the end of it, they you they find that their minds or their brains or their whatever the entity is a void 
that means they really have gotten enlightened. No, they, well, that, I, that, I am, that, I am that so word is, that is, <laughs> that so word is not the, that word is not the Buddhist word of Nirvana. No, 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 no. That is I'm not like, that hey, word. Hey, this no, makes no, no, sense. No, 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 no. no, no. That, 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 that word is not the word. See, uh, uh, that. yeah, okay. I'll yeah, please, okay. but no, go okay. ahead, go ahead. Tumai. Okay, you know, um, the reason why there is uh, often confusion about it, you're right, there is a void uh, in your relationship with the contents of the mind, right? There is void. So then we are looking for emptiness, and that's what the Buddhist position was. The difference between the Buddhist position and the, the correct, I would say correct, um, Vedantic or Shaivism, Kashmir Shaivism position is that the, what replaces the void is something transcendental. There is something which is Purna, right? Which is Shiva. In other words, it's not, it's empty in space and time, but it's full along another dimension, which is the dimension of consciousness. See, this is where all the confusion arises. In fact, uh, um, I uh, I just did the proofs yesterday. My proof in the Journal of AI and Consciousness, it's going to be published on Monday or Tuesday, and I'll send you each a copy where I prove what is the very heart of Kashmir Shaivism as a mathematical theorem. I call it the one observer theorem. It's, a, it's all mathematics. And I show it's got went to reviewers, and it's completely, it sort of shows that there can be only one consciousness in the universe. And I I used, I mentioned uh, Vedanta and Kashmir Shaivism in the paper itself, but then don't push it too much. You know, here it's going to mathematicians and so on. But that is what it is. It is empty, but it's empty in space and time. It's not empty in absolute terms. What replaces space and time is something else which is not in space and time. So Shiva is not in space and time, which is why um, in the Chidambaram temple, uh, in I think the Raj Sabha, I haven't been to Chidambaram temple, but I was writing something on it, so I had to look it up. There is the uh, an installation of Shiva, which is empty. So there is no Shivaling there. It's all empty. So that is the pure form of Shiva. Of, of emptiness, but not emptiness in space and time. See, that's where a lot of Indians also get it wrong. They think it's empty in space and time. It is empty in space and time, but it's along another dimension. But that dimension also interpenetrates because it's transcendent. It inter interpenetrates all our senses and also our body. See, that's why even studying the body, as the West did over the last 200 years, a lot of knowledge can be obtained. Body itself can reveal secrets. And in fact, that's how you begin. You study, and even Tantra, even Kundalini Yoga is going through the body. You know, of course, you're playing with your own body. So your body also reveals uh, things. But ultimately, you have to leave in your journey it's a tough journey, uh, Amrita. It's a tough journey. Please don't do it. <laughs> in, this, in this journey, eventually you reach a point where, and what it really means, let me tell you, what it really means is that you realize that your true self is not what you do, but you are still connected to it. You know, that's where you read in all these Vedic books and Kashmir Shaivism that you are in it and you're not in it. So you are while in it, you're not of it and you are content. That's what means that you are, uh, you have reached enlightenment. Enlightenment is that state of contentment. When you are in it, you are in space and time and still not of space and time. You are in your body, but still not of your body. And what that really does, and let me go to Krishna then, the story of Krishna. What it tells you then is that ultimately the detachment the virag that you read about in uh, in the bhagavad gita gets translated into love for everything you know into empathy and that is the frame the path of love right so it's a kind of a very amazing situation which cannot be expressed in any simple ai formula 
Wait, Subhash ji says, don't do this, Amrita, and then he'll be so excited yeah. and passionately <laughs> saying about this. <laughs> Because Amrita, this is the path of the warrior. And when you are a warrior, you're on the battlefield. And on the battlefield, unless you are very guarding yourself, very totally protected by shield, you can be killed any moment. I, I did say I'm afraid. Yeah, you have to be afraid. You please be afraid. Without fear, you cannot get in the battlefield. The fear should also no, protect no. You. I will be taking a drone and seeing the big picture. Don't worry. <laughs> okay. Don't you worry. I'm only curious. Uh, I don't want to be fighting anything at, at this time. I'm too scared for all that. All right. Thank you so much. All right. Who wants to go next? If they have any last, I, I, I had a question. Yeah, Raju. So it's it's this whole question of you know people talking about. You know, well, humans are conscious, but is can AI be conscious? I think that has always been, to me, that has been a totally uh, illogical question. It, it's might be based on Kashmiri Shaivism. There is only consciousness, and uh, this body, and this, you know, whether it's an AI thing or whether this is this body that is me here right now, it's just a body. You know, it's it's just a piece of jhag, right? It's not consciousness. It's consciousness is. Uh, is the thing that is animating this body. It's the same thing that is animating AI also. It's animating everything. This whole universe is being animated by consciousness. So there is nothing but consciousness. And our mind somehow splits it up into these forms and objects, into space and time and all this thing. It's just a creation of our mind. And we are not, uh, we are, we are not super mind enough to be able to think of it in, as one single entity. Uh, as one single consciousness, but I think the what what Shaivism has been trying, Kashmiri Shaivism has been trying to tell us throughout is that at a certain once you get if you can uh, if you can tune yourself in a certain manner, you can reach a state where you'll start realizing that you know your way of thinking of this world as uh, as yourself as this human being is a very flawed thing, and that eventually. You know, you are you are just part of the you're part of a whole big thing, and there's there's no you separate from anything else. You know, there is only but, one thing. As you were saying, Rajinder, uh, the um, body is like money. It's good to say we don't care for money, but it's good to have money in the bank. Do you see that? Uh, so we love money, we love body as well. Yeah, and, no, I mean, I'm not saying that we do that. <laughs> we, uh, but it's a thinking mind that does that, right? right. And uh, but the consciousness that is beyond the mind, beyond everything, is the one that is actually animating our mind. But of course, something. Western thought will say that there's nothing beyond the mind. It's only in our brain. Yeah, and this know, is a big, big leap. If the West were to accept our in the Kashmiri or the Indian position, that will mean that the world will change. But right now, uh, the people who make policy decisions, the people who live their lives, most of them, but accepting for a small minority and believe that uh, mind uh, or consciousness is a product of the brain. And, and so it's incidental. And the only thing that matters is the body. And it's a very powerful message also. And our own young people or young people everywhere get seduced by it. It's a very powerful thing. And right. you can't just say it's not, it, it, just ignore it. Because after all, while we might say, I am the bo I am in the body, but really, I'm still the body. Do you see that? There are all these paradoxes. Yeah, so, I mean, so this, is, this is a question that is being, you know, actually being, even in the Western sciences, there's this thing called the hard problem of consciousness versus the right. simple problem of consciousness. So there's a simple problem is you can find correlations between the way you observe things and you know between the way you react to things and all that. But the hard problem is to actually say, what is the... Uh, the smell of chocolate, where does that come, you know, uh, is there any, there's no way to correlate that with anything else. What makes the smell of chocolate, the smell of chocolate that is in, you know, for you. So this is the way they kind of put it, you know, what makes a bad uh, sense of the world, mm -hmm. its sense of the world, you know, as as opposed, the brain can only do some correlations, do things like that, but it, the actual, uh, actual consciousness part of it is something which is, it's kind of separate from it, you know, and, and I don't think, I, as far as I can see, they have come to anything close to 
uh, solving that problem. Yeah, let me, if... let, me, let, let me steer us back to Amrita's question, and let me try to help in a different way. Okay. Non-living entities, when they have a void, like these robots, a void there is the absence. It's absence. But living entities, what is a void? In a living entity, the phenomena that is happening is of dissolution and then creation. That is the dance of Shiva. So when you use rasa to do dissolution, dissolution, see, Ratri is very important. Dawn, of course, we love dawn. But Ratri is important because Ratri is the time of regeneration. Without Ratri, there can't be any dawn. So that's the Jugalbandi of Shiva. And that only life can have. So when Subhash says to you, listen to music, what he's really saying is, experience that dance of dissolution, but assuredly that dissolution will be fo followed by creation. And that's where that differs from the void or emptiness. Dissolution and emptiness are different. Yeah, got it, got it. They basically got, got short-circuited. Yeah, they got short-circuited. They got a little bit. Okay. Got it. Any last things? Uh, this was a very, very important chapter. And uh, uh, I a have a question, uh, Rakesh. Uh, which, uh, did you go to any of the India-related places in China on your trip? I, I, as I said, my whole trip was focused on the Buddhist temples. Oh, I see. And I uh, made some uh, stunning discoveries, which I will share with you and discuss with you. And when it's fully baked, we'll talk to this group about it. But uh, which, which places did you go in China? I basically went to the northern part. I went to Beijing, which is where you have a lot of imperial Buddhist temples. And then I went up north, four hours away, to a city called Chengdu. And mm -hmm. Chengdu has a lot of Buddhist temples. And uh, so a uh, lot of interesting, interesting discoveries. The autumn moon. Uh, Mid-autumn festival was just one of those serendipitous discoveries, but uh, there were other more important discoveries. And did I you think the... any... sorry, I was going to just ask: Did you meet any uh, Chinese who actually were able to look back upon the, you know, the commonality or the uh, back and forth that uh, that had actually, uh, you know, some of the Buddhist thoughts that had traveled all the way from Kashmir to the uh, were there any people who have that purpose, or was that something that you were able to just discover on your own? They have completely lost it. They have lost all of that knowledge. They are so clueless. Robotic, right? Yeah. Robot. They have completely lost all knowledge. You know. And it is, it is a huge opportunity for India uh, to, you know, there are 300 million Buddhists there, huge opportunity for India. Yeah, go ahead, Amrita. No, I was saying that 1.4 billion robots, honestly, uh, but uh, it was a realization when I came and moved to the West Coast. It It's like, uh, there's a lot of people here in Bay Area and, the majority are uh, Indians and Chinese, and um, it's it's very difficult. Uh, it's very hard to see people like uh, that. I don't are know you how saying to explain that they're, it. 
that even the Bay Area, most people are like robots. AI rules, not only in China but even no, in the I'm, US. No, I'm saying that you know that it's it. I I don't see. Uh, it's so hard. Like I I don't see, uh, and I I want probably <laughs> stop this recording. <laughs> but uh, but I feel like um, I feel sad that there is so much of rasa that can be experienced and somehow i am unable to understand how they feel fulfilled but um, amrita i think that's true all over the world most people live like ai see this is i think this is the deepest lesson of <laughs> this ai unfolding revolution of ai what uh, society will realize that first of all most jobs that people do are like ai jobs people could be replaced by machines and so and most of our lives also are near us you know without rasa and and so i think this this will also confront people with their own solitude or their aloneness kaivalya right aloneness and this i think personally there's going to be a huge crisis across the world um there will be wars there will be this and that and i don't know how people will deal with it uh, on their own um, yeah. because yeah it's going, i i mean it's sad i i just had like this question of when i came here and now that you're mentioning uh, that you visited china rakesh i was just thinking like what is the value system that you would think is of chinese right currently of common people so look uh... I've been going to China. I was stunned that uh, the standard of living of Chinese today, I think, already exceeds that in America and in Europe. When you adjust for purchase power parity, their standard of living is they live in better homes. The cities are spotless, they drive better cars, the, they wear better clothes. Uh, so it's been a miracle what the Communist Party has done. So, so the value in, system is the, materialistic, right, isn't it? Very, very much materialistic. And, uh, and so, you know, in terms of their objective function, uh, they've certainly they've certainly achieved that and so uh, but it's very materialistic yeah it's very but uh, it's it upsets me because i feel like there's so much out there i i don't know like i just don't understand it actually i'm mean, like so sad but it's hard but to Amrita, make conversation also sometimes but amrita chinese uh, culture if you go back into history is a material culture you know they, they they didn't have religion or spirituality of the kind exists in india uh, confucianism is just worship of the elders or the ancestors so they by nature by their culture they work hard they are smart they just work hard they want to uh, achieve for their family or for the glory of their ancestors so they're practical people and mm -hmm. uh, and that's why and since they are disciplined that's why Truly, in a in a uh, fair competition, Europeans and certainly not American. Americans can't compete with them. They lose to uh, the Chinese, uh, and uh, uh, and you know, and there are other things as well. Uh, just this two hundred schools were um, in were surveyed in Maryland. This story came out a couple of days ago. Only five percent of all the high school graduates know math. You know, Americans are not disciplined. Young people, and 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 also, let's not forget. It's European, also like karma yoga, Euro maybe. You know, European supremacy is a blip in history. I think that uh, Singaporean foreign minister says this often in his lectures. Uh, the last two hundred years, when Europe has been supreme, this is a blip in history. If you go back into history, it's been China and India. You know, most of the world's uh, domestic GDP has been China and India. India, in fact, more than even China. And it's going to come back to that. India and China would be uh, at the top. And, that... and I, 
I'll I'll add Amrita that I don't think all is lost with the Chinese people because I personally last week I have a Chinese colleague of mine at work and she had the most beautiful like mythological story to share with me about some uh, I think around the autumn winter fest uh, autumn moon festival yeah. itself, she told me this uh, marvelous story I'll I'll have to have her recount it to me again for more details but she said that there is like um, you know like uh the the idea of that there were initially i think 17 or 19 suns or nine suns that that existed in the sky and then there was some event took place and now only one sun remains in the sky and uh there were these two lovers and they got separated and the woman lives on the moon and so every autumn winter fest uh, autumn moon festival they say that the 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 woman is peering out from the moon looking for her uh, beloved on the earth so there are all these stories that I think we need to hear more from them. They're hidden, they're untapped, undiscovered. Maybe they're known to the Chinese people, but we we should hear more from them. And you know, they have their own richness in in their stories that we can see parallels to our stories and our mythology. I'm sure. So yeah. Well, it's interesting you mentioned that story because I have used that story in the latest novel that I have written. And so that story uh, is is a very very interesting story, and I, I I do agree with you. I personally think that Chinese poetry is probably the greatest poetry, especially Chinese poetry that's written by women. But I'll give you one example of their value system. Maybe when I get my act together, uh, we'll I'll I'll walk you guys through my uh, trip to China. But I will give you one thing that is very striking. One of the most beautiful gardens in Beijing is a garden, it's a huge garden, but imagine a uh, martyr or Avantipura multiplied 100 times over. Shattered white marble palaces, temple just shattered and blown away. But unlike India, what the Chinese have done is they've kept the broken pieces the way they are, but they have created lakes and each stone has been put on a pedestal. And you know what? People come there in hundreds of thousands because it's such a beautiful place, but it has a rasa of its own because everything is shattered. And the one message they give everybody is this, that if China is not technologically on the forefront, the same thing will happen to them again. So this was the place, the palace, where the British, the French, the Germans came and basically during the Boxer Rebellion, uh, you know, just defeated the Chinese emperor and destroyed everything. They were very brutal about it. But the Chinese used that lesson. And so uh, if there's one similarity between Kashmir and China, it is the importance of knowledge. Uh, I didn't realize this, uh, when you look at the Forbidden City, there are three doors, uh, three entrances. Only the emperor and his royal family were allowed to go through the central door, middle door. Uh, then on one side, uh, the army senior officials could go. And on the other side, the high palace uh, courtiers could go. There was only one exception. And the one exception was that they used to have a very complicated uh, series of competitive exams through the whole country. And the guy who would be number one, he would be given the supreme honor that he could enter the forbidden city through the entrance reserved for the emperor. And you may remember in Kashmir that we had something similar that before a king could be anointed, before a king could be anointed, 
he would have to pick a sacred text and he'd have to pay the brahmanas to get a copy of the text made and then the text would be carried on the elephant and that text would be first placed on the throne and the king would have to first pray to that text on the throne to show his obeisance to knowledge and only then would he be allowed to sit on the throne and then the abhishekam would be done on him the royal consecration so we should be under no illusion that the chinese uh, irrespective of the communist system and their discipline and hard work they do have pursuit of knowledge as their you know uh, prime prime directive now a lot, of, uh, lot of video games are also like uh, based on strategy and warfare actually are very much chinese based yeah yeah, yeah. All okay right. uh, okay guys uh, we continue we are now in the final level and so this thing just Listen. keeps getting more exciting and more interesting and but we are reaching yeah. there tomorrow uh, uh, sorry next week we are going to uh, do both sargas uh, mm -hmm. because they are kind of the last one is very short so we'll yeah. do 15 16 together yeah. and it will be fun yeah and um uh, yeah, it's nice to gather again after two weeks. Uh, it was um, a one week, actually, a break of one week. Um, yeah. But yeah, thanks, everyone. And I hope you have a nice weekend. Thanks, Subhash Ji and Rakesh uh, Ji. Nice, nice weekend, everybody. Namaskar, namaskar. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice, weekend. Thank you. Have a nice, nice okay. long weekend. Bye. 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 Thank you. Namaskar.